wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. Chris Voss here from the Chris Voss Show.com. The Chris Voss Show.com. Hey, we're cutting here in the Nerd Great Podcast. We certainly appreciate you guys tuning in. Thanks for being here. As always, go to subscribe to YouTube.com for Chess Chris Voss. Hit the bell notification button. Go to Goodreads.com for Chess Chris Voss. See everything we're reading and reviewing over there. Also, go to all of our groups on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, all those cool places the kids are playing. Watch for our upcoming coverage of CES show, the Consumer Electronics Show, whatever it's called. You know what it's about. It's uh, coming up next week. It's going to be an adventure. Not only am I going to interview, I think we've got about 30 appointments or something. We're going to be interviewing people live at the booth. We're going to be talking to people. It's going to be a really interesting show. But also, I'll be dodging the omicron virus so you get to see me that I'll, i think i'll be wearing a hazmat suit to the show so it'll be interesting anyway guys uh we have an amazing author on the show she's written a lot of books she is the author of a new book that came out october 26 2021 called a dog's world imagining the lives of dogs in a world without humans jessica pierce is going to be with us on the show she's going to be talking about her uh, beautiful book and some of the aspects of what she put into it she is a bioethicist she's one of the world's foremost scholars in environmental bioethics and animal ethics because you know my dogs do need to learn some ethics i, I think it's uh, is an anti-ethical to eat your own poop i don't know her books explore various facets of the human animal relationship with a particular focus on ethics of living well with companion animals her work has been featured in the new york times the washington post the guardian and scientific american she writes a regular blog for psychology today called all dogs go to heaven <clears throat> excuse me jessica is a uh, faculty affiliate at the center for bioethics and humanities at the university of colorado Anschutz. i can't remember if i got that right or not medical school and welcome to the show uh, jessica can i get that last word right again you did um, all right and thank you chris for having me it's nice to thank be you here. thank you i had to pause for a second because i was thinking about some of my dogs that have passed on and you know that that when i said i don't know, all dogs go to heaven it kind of Ooh, put me in a place there but welcome to the show jessica we well uh, congratulations on the new book oh, it's wonderful to have you thank you it's nice to be here there you go uh, give us your plugs or people can find you on the interwebs and get to know more about you all right so my plug is uh, particularly about this book is that it's a, a thought experiment about hmm. what would happen to dogs in a world without us it's i think it's a really interesting book it's i learned the most from writing this book than I have from any other book that I've worked on and um, really had my thinking about dogs warped and altered in significant ways. So I think my plug is, I think it's a fascinating thought experiment. I'm not mm. sure other people in the world think it's a fascinating thought experiment, yeah. but, but go there, check it out, think about it. My dogs and they were horrified. They're like, you're the treat person. Where would we be without the treat person? Anyway. See, my dog, well, she was, she had mixed feelings about it. She thought I'd have a lot more opportunity just to do whatever the heck I want mm -hmm. without you looking over my shoulder saying, oh, stop that. Yeah. You could chew on everything and just go exactly. wherever you want to go. And like you said, eat poop whenever you want to. There you go. Give us your dot com so that people can find you on the interweb. Okay. JessicaPierce.net. There you go. And uh, so, Jessica, you come up with this theory. And so the book is about imagining the lives of dogs in a world without humans. I cheated and read your subtitle. Tell us, tell us a bit more about how that expands in the book. So, yeah, and I can tell you a little bit about what motivated the book for me and Mark. This was our fourth book together. And throughout the books that we've worked on and a couple of books that I've worked on myself, I've really thought hard and long about the question of what it means to live ethically with companion animals. And often when you think of animal ethics or like animal welfare and advocacy, you think of 
animals in agriculture or animals in labs, these animals who are really very obviously have welfare challenges. Mm -hmm. And you don't think about pets because you think oh, they're pampered. They have these soft beds and they get a bowl of kibble every morning and every night and they don't really have to do anything. They have easy lives. And I have felt that's not necessarily the case. And the last book that Mark and I wrote together was called Unleashing Your Dog. And it was really about letting your dog be a dog. And one thing that was surprising to me was that it's actually a hard question to answer. What does it mean to let a dog be a dog? That mm. seems super obvious, but what does it mean to let a dog engage in natural doggy behaviors? Mm. And oddly enough, many of the things that we expect of our dogs who live as pets are unnatural. We're constantly training them not to be dogs or scolding them for, be dog, for being dogs. So this latest book was an exploration of what does it actually mean mm. to be a dog and what does that look like in the absence of humans? Um, are dogs still dogs? Absolutely. And in mm. fact, they're, they maybe have more interesting lives without us always in the background hovering around telling them not to do what they really want to do. <laughs> I, I don't know. My, my dogs are really attached to me with uh, dog treats. And they actually had this little game they were playing with me for a short while. They knew how I didn't have doggy doors installed yet. And so I'd have to bring them in through a two-door system and be like from the garage, come in and then down into the basement. And I'd be like, come on in. And they would park at the top of the stairs and look at me and be like, we want treats if we're coming in. It's like a negotiation. <laughs> and and so I'd have to shake the treat bag that would give them, oh, okay, the idiot's going to give us treats now. And uh, then they come down. But if I didn't shake the treat bag, they just sit there. Like, yeah, we're not working with you. Not doing and it. Yeah. Not doing it, which doesn't work in winter because it's like colder. But we did that for a while and I just barely this week installed doggy doors. And now they're really pissed at me because they, because they took they away their the bargaining treats. power. Yeah. You just, if you want to come in, you want to leave, I don't care, I do whatever. But they still get lots of treats. But it's funny that, that now they're just constantly hounding me going, can we get treats? Can we get treats? <laughs> they're really spoiled. Can you tell me? That, that's how all dogs should be. Yeah, definitely, definitely. They get chicken and everything. They're just, they have their own uh, pet beds. And yeah, it's pretty much out of control around here. Well, so what are bi bioethics and, and stuff like that? How's that? Is that kind of what you draw on in the book? Uh, so give, give us a layman's term of how that works, um, bioethics. Yeah, so I'm not your typical bioethicist. I, that's the mm -hmm. first thing I'll say. My, my training is in philosophy and theology, ethical theory. And most people in bioethics do medical. And I did actually in earlier in my career teach at a medical school. And I thought about ethical issues in, in human health and medicine, the sort of intersection of, of the medical system and the humanistic disciplines of, of philosophy and theology and law and so forth. Mm -hmm. And I switched into thinking about animals in the way I do when I had a dog, you were talking about this at the beginning, I had a dog who was nearing the end of life and I was having to make decisions about quality of life and prolonging life and euthanasia. And I'm like, you know, these the issues that I'm facing with Odie are exactly the same issues that medical ethicists are dealing with in the healthcare system mm -hmm. with patients who are nearing the end of life and family members who are facing these decisions. But there was just a lot less conversation about making these decisions and navigating this drain with companion animals. It's definitely the terrain of a bioethicist, but typically people will focus on human issues and I'm more interested in human animal issues. I had that too uh, experience and I think a lot of people do when they're when their dogs start getting sick and you're making those choices. I, I had so many people that would come to me and be like, you just need to put them down. Just give up, put them down. Yeah. And I'm just like, wow, I, I hope I'm not your relative when it comes I to know. <laughs> Isn't that funny? You would never say that about somebody's. Yeah, mother. you never, you never just go to say, "Hey, my mom is. Uh, she got a little COVID. Yeah, just, you, you should put her down. Yeah, yeah just she's yeah. gonna suffer. She put looks uncomfortable. Down. Yeah, and in fact, one one of my dogs had a. She had this. I forget what it was called, but it was an infection that can grow between the organs and tissue, mm -hmm. and it, penicillin won't get to it. 
And so what ha eventually happens, it eventually it keeps expanding to a point it breaks out of the skin. And when it does, the air gets to it. And of course, then you can treat it. And that was all my dog had. But we knew it wasn't cancer and we just knew this thing was growing. And I'm like, can we just stab it? And they're like, no, that could be worse, especially if it's cancer. And so we just had to wait for a week or two for this thing to pop out. And I had people calling me saying, put her down. And she lived for another three years after that. Oh, wow. once, once we, once it blew out, yeah. it was done. It was the most weirdest thing ever. But man, I, I would have lost three years of gold, uh, yeah. just pure gold. And I don't know, when it comes to my dogs and, and some human beings, I won't say which ones, maybe <laughs> politicians or something. I don't know. I'm just <laughs> kidding. But I, there are some people that I think probably are better, higher uh, humans on the put down scale should be put down than dogs. That's just my opinion anyway. So uh, give us some tips or some different prospects of the book and and should we learn something from this? Like maybe we should let our dogs maybe run around and play more or do something yeah. more? So the so there are two questions that we address in the book. One is would dogs survive without humans? And the answer to that is almost certainly yes. Mm -hmm. um, most dogs would survive. Would be there would be a rough transition period, assuming there's some all inclusive rapture and every human disappears tomorrow. Dogs rely, even dogs who don't live as pet dogs rely on us for human resource, food resources in the form of garbage or handouts or feces. And so the, the transition would be rough. One thing that always surprises people when I say this, and it surprised me when I first heard it, is that of a, the billion or so dogs on the planet, which take a moment to let that sink in, that's wow. that's a lot of dogs. That's a lot um, of dog poop scooping. That's a lot know. of of the billion or so dogs on the planet. Only about twenty percent of those live as pets. Oh wow! So dogs are already living on their own. And one of the things that really irks me is when people say, "Oh, they need people. Dogs are are our shadow and can't survive without our love and our companionship." And it's just not true. They can and they do and in many ways they'd be better off, which is sad to think about. And then the other thing that we explored in the book which really we give more attention to is what would the what would happen to dogs over time? What would the evolutionary trajectory mm. look? And this is purely speculation, but would what would they eat if dogs don't have kibble or mm -hmm. human garbage? Mm. How would they hunt for larger prey like deer, in which case they would have to form packs? Or would they eat little stuff? And would dogs, what would they look like? Right now, there's extreme morphological diversity. In, in other words, there are extreme physical types. If you think of a multi-poo, little tiny two-pound dog versus an Irish wolfhound who wouldn't fit in the back of a huge SUV, would dogs become large or would they become tiny? Would it depend on the ecosystem that they're trying to survive in? What would happen to huskies in Phoenix? What would happen to chihuahuas in Juneau, Alaska? And so it's a speculation about what they would look like, what they would eat, how they would manage to reproduce without our help, which I think the answer to that pretty yeah. happily. Yeah, I think they know how to do that. And then what would happen to their inner lives, their cognitive and emotional lives. There are some interesting things about dogs that are unique to mm -hmm. dogs as the only domesticated canid that we that we share the planet with. For example, dogs have specialized facial musculature that allows them to very successfully solicit attention or beg for food. It's mm -hmm. called puppy dog eyes. <laughs> You've seen it. Your dogs probably give it to you every day when every day. they're waiting for their treats that are not forthcoming enough. And what would happen to those, those traits that are, or behaviors that are specifically evolved for dogs to better communicate with us, manipulate us, et cetera. Would they have any usefulness in a future without us? Maybe. And then I think ultimately like the ethical point of the book, which is of course, what's most interesting for me is what does this tell us about how we treat our dogs now and what can we do to help them I guess you could say discover their inner wild <laughs> a little bit more. One example, very specific example, is just recognizing that dogs are olfactory creatures. We mm. live, humans are visual creatures. 
So mm -hmm. visual stimuli is really important to us, but for dogs, it's olfactory stimuli. So when you take your dog for a walk, for God's sake, let your dog sniff and let mm -hmm. your dog sniff what your dog is interested in sniffing, not what you think might be interesting to sniff, which is going to be really probably boring to your dog. And just give them the time and space to, to be a dog in as much as that's possible within this very constrained environment that we expect pet dogs to live in. So I'm being a bad, I'm being a bad dog owner if I don't let my dog do whatever she wants when she wants to go sniffing. And <laughs> <laughs> within reason, it's hard though because it's kind, of, it's illegal to be, to let your dog be free mm -hmm. as much as they would like to be in many places. You just you can't have your dog off leash, or yeah. you, you can, or you you'll, you'll get a ticket, or you'll get some irate other dog walker yelling at you. So it's really a balancing of what dogs need with what's possible, given mm. the constraints of our culture. Yeah. Our I have huskies. You can't trust them off leash. Too. No, yeah. no. And they are I, the kennel that we used to take our dog OD to. She would not take huskies <laughs> because yeah. they were so good at escaping. Really? Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, they, they, they're, they're any super fence safe. they could get out of, and they're just they want to be free. Yeah, can't blame them. They're like me. That's why yeah. I stayed single all these years. I'll climb any fence to get away. The, so this is pretty interesting. I know that since I love Siberian Huskies, and I've had four of them now, and I, I know that they are. I think they're the closest thing to wolves or wild dogs, to my understanding. You're the professor, so I'll. I'll defer to you. They learned over time. They're like, hey, man, we can get some pretty consistent stuff from these idiots over here, these human beings, uh, rather than just wandering around the wild fighting over stuff. Uh, let's let's work with these people because they're, yes. they're dumb and they're big, <laughs> but they have treats. They have good food. Yeah. And they've done all the work to get it ready for us. Um, yeah. So th I think your question's loaded. There are a couple of things in there. Um, one is about these breeds of dog who are more wolf. And one of the questions that we get all the time about this book and which we thought about when we were writing is intuitively, it seems like the more wolf-like sort of ancient breeds might have a better shot at survival mm -hmm. just because they, their physical shape is intact, sort of relative to the canid plan and compared to, for example, I, I always pick on the snub nosed dogs, but French bulldogs, I'm sorry, they're mm. very cute, but they can't breathe very well. And that's going to be a problem in the future if humans aren't around to, to assist. And so I think the wolf like breeds, it's quite possible that they would have an edge up on, on other types of dogs in the survival game. You guys are going to make it when the apocalypse hits, <laughs> which is soon, evidently, according yeah, to... Yeah, one, uh, one of the things that we do in the book that was entertaining for us was we talk about doomsday prepping mm. for our dogs. There are two things, doomsday prepping for our dogs, assuming we're still around, stockpiling a lot of kibble, but doomsday prepping our dogs. So if, if you knew you weren't going to be here in a year... Would you start your dog on a physical exercise regimen and mm. make your dog go out and do some hunting on her own to hone her skills and get tough and make her stay out in the cold for a little while so that she would develop some, you know, resilience? And or do we just let them be pampered and hope for the best? <laughs> I have this vision of apocalyptic vision of like roving bands of Pomeranians. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Which is truly terrifying, honestly. Sure. Yeah. And you know. yeah, and that's one of the things that that <laughs> really became clear in the book is you can't make any assumptions about who's going to survive. And Pomeranians might do quite well. Because yeah, you never know. They're um, I mean, tenacious little creatures. Yeah, they can get the small little animals and they're just exactly. they're or little vicious and army. That'll yeah. just bark them to death. That's usually... They have about to die whenever they get around one. I'm like, I don't know how people live with those things. Uh, I love dogs, but I don't like barky dogs. That's that's the that's where the line gets drawn with me. But no, my huskies they are always out hunting. My one, my first husky was a granddaughter of an Iditarod racer from Alaska, mm -hmm. and she was really purebred. She mm -hmm. had like her papers and everything, and she loved to be out in the cold. Like the colder it would get, and the deeper the snow would get, she the more she wouldn't come in. And she was a hunter and she was, I was just in her world 
pretty much that's how we our relationship was and but yeah I, I imagine some dogs would definitely have a hard time part of the you know, all the, the inbreeding of how they made a lot of the, some of these things like you you said the some those bulldogs i yeah. feel sorry for some of those dogs sometimes some people love them but clearly and some of them have higher genetic defects or cancer from the genetic defects than other dogs or, or have different issues like hip yeah. dysplasia and stuff yeah. And that's, you know, what one of the chapters in the book is called gains and losses. And we made a, a call a, a table of all the things that dogs have to gain and lose by humans disappearing. And perhaps not surprisingly, the, the gains column was much longer and more robust. And one of the things that dogs definitely have to gain by us to disappearing is the that there would no longer be this kind of insane breeding deliberate breeding of dogs who have maladaptive traits who suffer not only may not be able to survive but who suffer now every day a, a diminished um, lifestyle i know it makes people angry when i say that but i do think that it's wrong to deliberately introduce those traits or, or promote them when we have a choice not to yeah they, they clearly can't breathe i know i've probably lost the bulldog crowd here but oh, maybe <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have some friends who they live next door to a couple who has a bulldog and the, the, the dog can't go for walks more than 15 minutes. They have a stroller for the dog um, <laughs> because the, the dog literally is not allowed to walk more than 15 minutes a day because of breathing oh, yeah. difficulties and has had several surgeries already at, at a year old. And wow. it's sad. That's not to say that any dog couldn't have issues like that. I must admit that I have a stroller for my dog there because go. she had she has a dislocated and she loves it. Yeah, my huskies would never, no matter how bad off they got, would never. Talk. You'd be, you might be surprised because I said that about Bella. She's a cranky <laughs> really? dog really? who doesn't tolerate much of anything. But what the the trick was treats. Ah, the well, first time I got the stroller out, I just I put a ton of treats in there, and she jumped in and. She was a little freaked out, but then I just started feeding her treats and treats. And now she actually goes in there even when we're not going for a walk. Just <laughs> she's like, I'm going to get some free treats. I know that one one thing that my dogs would love for me to be gone for is I'm always kicking them out of the bed or at least moving them when I go to bed. Because I'm like, get out of my way. I, you know, this is my bed. And they're just like, no, no it's no, our no. bed. We were That's here first. I'm like, no, it's my bed. I'm big enough. I will crush you. So you must move. <laughs> But uh, yeah, they're never happy. They're like, hey, man, we, we've been here for hours, man. This is our bed. This is we're always here. But uh, what are some other tidbits and aspects that you can tease out about the book? Let's see. We've talked about doomsday prepping and we've talked about gains and losses. I'm not I doing mean, doomsday prepping. If the world's going to hell, that, that, I'm sorry, man. I'm not taking them with me. No, but like, <laughs> should you get them ready for it? I don't know. Man. Maybe think, yours already. We're are. all going. We're all going out. And that's the thing. Yeah, about, I guess it depends on the doomsday, right? It does, although it seems it's like an asteroid. Pretty story. tenuous place right now. Yeah. So yeah, we talked about we talked about morphology and feeding ecology, and yeah, one of the phrases that I like from the book is um, imagining a world of dog possibilities, and just that the human and dog relationship even though it's wonderful and i have a bond with my dog it, that's very special but it's not a dog's purpose to be our pet necessarily there are a lot of things a lot of things that dogs can be mm -hmm. even in the world now and i used to think that feral and free-ranging dogs were unfortunate because they didn't have a human home Mm -hmm. And I really have changed my thinking about that. The main research base that we used for this book was the research on free-ranging dogs, which wow. is fascinating. Um, and it's not something that dog owners typically read. We read stuff on dog cognition and studies that were done in dog cognition labs, which are interesting too. Mm -hmm. But it's really different to look at the behavior of free-ranging dogs and just to take two little examples. One is the role of fathers in parenting. It's often said, oh, dogs, male dogs don't engage in parenting behavior, but it's not actually true. They don't engage in parenting behavior in captive 
settings because we don't let them. Wow. It's not set up. Breeding of dogs is not set up in such a way that that fathers have any opportunity to participate. But in studies of free ranging dogs, there is a role for fathers, at least in, in some studies. Fathers will help get food. They'll help protect the babies and not only fathers, but aunts and uncles and, and other what you would call in the scientific literature, allo parents. And I think that's pretty interesting. And another interesting tidbit from the research on feral and free ranging dogs is home range size. A pet dog who has a little backyard is pretty lucky, but free ranging dogs would have a home range anywhere from, you know, some are as small as half an acre. Some have a home range as large as 7,000 acres. Yeah. So under naturalistic conditions, a dog would cover a lot of ground and it gives you an awareness of how tightly constrained their physical and social worlds are under our management. Yeah. My Huskies, when they would escape, they would be caught two or three miles away. Yeah. One time, Shadow, the wolf, was she was caught going down the freeway at 2 a.m. in the morning. Just oh, wow. Going down just... the freeway. Guy pulled over, thankfully, and picked her up off the freeway. <laughs> but, but yeah, she just, I don't know, she wanted the express lane. So she was going somewhere fast. Yeah. Well, it's just... <laughs> Good. I'm glad she caught that. That's a husky for you. But yeah, it's interesting to me. And maybe we should let our dogs, and maybe the uh, good lesson in the book is that we should let our dogs revel more and dog them and let them really enjoy their stuff. And I see a lot of people, they take their dogs for a walk and they're like, go pee and get down and, and they're barking at them and drag them back in the house. Yeah. And it's, you know, that's a, that's a horrible interaction with your dog. Yeah. It's not mm -hmm. very fun for the dog. Yeah. And even something as simple as walking, I've, I've been trying to rethink the language even because mm -hmm. dogs, so dogs are, canids are cursorial mm -hmm. mammals, which means that they, they run. The walking pace is not preferred pace mm -hmm. of the canid. Neither is walking in a straight line, which is what we do when we walk them on a leash. For dogs, that's pretty frustrating. They want to zigzag around and go follow their noses and stop and start. And so finding ways to exercise them that let them engage in those more interesting forms of physical movement is something that's not too hard to do. I mean, you can, some people call it free choice walking and they'll actually, it's funny to watch. They'll follow their dog. I do hmm. that too. I'm sure I look ridiculous. If she wants to go that way, I go that way. And if she wants to stop, I stop. And if she wants to dart over there, she doesn't dart anymore because of her leg, but just let them choose for once. Yeah. They pose a lot of choices on them and just give them more agency. One of my knows we're talking about, she's here licking my hand. Oh, you know, why are you guys talking about me? If you want more research on your book, I'm going to be uh, going to CS for, I think three or four days. And my little baby, my, my daddy's girl one, she has some real attachment problems with me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like we have to turn on the podcast when I leave to go to the gym, anytime I'm gone for two or three hours, it's like the end of the world. And I have cameras set up so I can call in and be like, it's okay. I'm here. And, yeah. And that's just for an hour. And so we're yeah. going to go four days. So it's going to be oh, really that's interesting. That's going to be hard. Yeah. yeah. And they like everybody, but they it's, it's just not daddy. We'll see how that goes. They're going to get a taste of your book, basically. I hope it goes well for them. It goes for me too. I, I could, hopefully I don't come back to something torn into shreds, which. Well, you might. <laughs> That's the price you pay. <laughs> That's the price I pay. Uh, they're pretty good. But the other thing is, is, I know uh, I get yelled at a lot too. My one puppy will come into the bathroom and be like, you taught us that you're not supposed to do this in the house and you're doing, you're a hypocrite. <laughs> That's the big thing. That Isn't that do. funny? I, we totally yeah. are. Yeah. And I, there are some rules that we make that I'm sure seem completely <laughs> arbitrary, like don't take food off the table or the yeah. counter, like we do it. Yeah, but you can. Why aren't we allowed to do that? And why don't we get to be on the couch? And I don't yeah. know. Maybe my dog's home... pretty spoiled. She gets to do all these things. Maybe your next book should be on discrimination and non-inclusivity in in dog human world. How well how it's different. it actually sort of <laughs> is. <laughs> oh really? Okay. Uh, it's about living living ethically with dogs in the context of this 
pet human relationship and um, taking up things like, I don't know, is it ethical for your dog to eat poop? I don't go out and, <laughs> and, and overwatch them, but if I catch them, that, that would be bad. I'd be like, yeah, nope. maybe not unethical, maybe just gross. Yeah, I don't know what they're you. doing out there. It's a pretty big yard. Yeah. So it's just as long as they don't do that in the house, like bring it in the house and be like, hey, this is great, yeah. which I, they've done from every <laughs> every couple of years. Something like that will happen where some of them bring one in. And you're like, no, we're not doing this. But we have a bone problem with bones because they mm -hmm. give them like marrow bones and stuff like that. They'll bring the marrow burn in the house and you're just like, no, that's nasty. Get it outside. Yeah. But maybe I'm just being unethical. I Or maybe they are. Yeah. But... Something like that. I'll call my attorney and yeah I, I think you ought to work this out I, yeah, they, I, uh, they have in, their own attorneys and, and their own podcast too oh that's great yeah, yeah i like that yeah. yeah in this new book i use a phrase it's i didn't come up with it it's i think it is from a veterinarian named karen overall which she talks about negotiated settlements with our mm. dogs just basically what living with a dog is that mm. we just have to figure out the compromises that work because their natural behaviors are very different from our preferred natural behaviors, but we can't just ask them not to do anything that they feel highly motivated to do. There you go. So I didn't know I was extorting them, training them all this time where I'm like, sit and roll over and play dead and those sort of things. Has that been extortion on my part where I've been some well, sort of form of... <laughs> it, it could be seen in that way. It could be also them manipulating you and training you ah to see, now we have it <laughs> in the in train dog they are yeah. not yeah that's yeah i don't think it. we give them enough credit for and I, they really are have more control over the situations <laughs> than we <laughs> like to think because we're very self-centered we just let the idiot ourselves. think he's in control like we just let him we're just playing along with him i get that a lot i'll put up a video on facebook and and, and people know how crazy i'm about my dogs and they'll be like i'll be like yeah look i'm i'm controlling my dogs and they'll be like no we're pretty sure they're running the game <laughs> on you buddy so there you go uh, anything more you want to touch on your book before we go out I don't think so. We've covered a lot of ground. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely a lot of dog ground. So give us your plugs before we go out so people can look you up on the internet, all your dot coms. Yeah, sure. So my website is Jessica Pierce. It's my name, J-E-S-I-C-A-P-I-E-R-C-E dot -E net. And there's contact info on the web, the website. And I have then the Psychology Today blog, which is All Dogs Go to Heaven. That's pretty easy just to Google Psychology Today, All Dogs Go to Heaven, Jessica Pierce, and you'll get right to it. And you'll see that I've been quite lazy. And although it's not oh. lazy, I've been quite distracted in the past years. More blogs are coming. They're there just, you go. There you go. All dog. I think all the dogs are going to heaven, and I think we all know where the humans are going. That's how it's going to all turn out in the end. Jessica, it's been wonderful to have you on the show. Thank you for coming by and sharing all this wonderful stuff yeah. with us. Thanks, Chris. It was nice talking to you. There you go. And to my audience, the order of the book, A Dog's World, Imagining the Lives of Dogs with... Yeah, I'm sorry. Imagining the lives of dogs in a world without humans. And uh, if I catch my dogs reading it, I'll know I'm screwed. The books, you can check it out and read all the good stuff because, I don't know, I love my dogs. And the one thing I do know is a rule of life. The more I get to know people, the more I like dogs. <laughs> so go to goodreads.com, where says Chris Foss. Go to youtube.com, Chris Foss. See all the wonderful things we're doing over there. All the groups, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. Thanks for tuning in. Be good to each other. Stay safe. And we'll see you guys next time.